thank you so much for coming today, and thank you so much, Brenda, for introducing me. Um, I, you probably all know Brenda Marston, um, the, the former, current former um, director of the uh, Sexuality Collection in the Kroc Library. Um, but I've always been a huge fan of her, so it's really lovely to get introduced by her. She has met all the people I admire practically in the world, I think, um, at least the living ones. So, uh, so this is kind of cool for me. All right, so, uh, uh, so here's the book. Um, I don't like PowerPoint, so I'm not going to do that. Please forgive me, and I'm just going to kind of launch into it. Um, so here's what I'm going to say. In 2022, uh, no fewer than 137 bills were introduced at the legislate, state legislative level to, uh, well, pers persecute uh, trans and non-gender conforming people. Many of those bills uh, pitted uh, the uh, what was understood as women's sports or the idea of women's sports, which they had seldom paid much attention to or supported very much. Prior to this, pitted women's sports against the interests of trans women who might want to participate in said sports. So the, the issues that trans historical addresses feel very urgent to me and, and very sharp, not least of all because um, being able to say that there are trans, what we call transestors, right, that there is a history to trans people in the world is tantamount to saying something about loving and cherishing and valuing the contribution of trans people in the world. Um, and saying that they have always existed is also a way of saying that they are valid. Now, I find that to be a really interesting problem. Why is it that it is legitimating to have a history? I don't really know, but I find that it is true. I find that knowing that there have been queer people and trans people in the distant past somehow functions as affirming to us as such people. And I think that that's uh, very much the impetus behind this collection. The joke about this collection, um, and I didn't bring the hardcover copy, was that it's you know big enough and solid enough that in a pinch you could use it to hit somebody. Um, and that is very much sort of its purpose. Um, along with a number, oh thank you, along with a number of other books uh, that I'll also be talking about, we thought of this uh, collection very much as an amassing of evidence. Um, there are works here, um, there, there are articles here that are from researchers who look at things as long ago as the Empire of Byzantium, and actually as recently as a Korean blockbuster from, I think, the 20 teens um, that had a trans character um, in it and was situated in a kind of faux medieval Korean landscape. Um, this is not to say that we're trying to be uh, comprehensive historically. Most of these works are situated in the Middle Ages, and the people who edited them, two of us, uh, Anna works on French, and I work on English, mostly Middle Ages. So we're kind of bound to that as our central um, force of gravity. Um, so here's what happened. Kathleen Long threw this conference, and Anna and I were old friends, and Greta is an old friend of Anna's, and we all went out for a drink at the Chanticleer, which turned into maybe two or three drinks, not to affirm that whole thing about how medievalists drink too much. Um, and at the Chanticleer, which, as you know, is a kind of a disreputable pub, um, <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about how exciting it was at this conference that there were actually several papers besides ours that dealt with trans topics or topics about gender nonconforming people. And what we said, and what I think has been true all along, is somebody should really do something about this. Like someone should really make a collection happen. And gradually, over the course of the evening, it went from somebody should do this to actually we could do this. And, and here's the saddest part, it would give us an excuse to hang out together a lot. And we were imagining that maybe we could use our research funds to like go on vacations to tropical places in order to do the editing work. In the end, the pandemic struck while we were working on this book. And so a lot of the work of this book was done from my living room with my kids up in like their room playing. Um, 
on Zoom while my fellow editors were also on Zoom and the authors were being emailed um, in real time with questions. So it was all much less glamorous than initially planned, I have to tell you. But it is really important about this book, and we actually say this in the introduction, that this book came out of friendship. That this book came out of friendship and the perception that there was a need. Um, I had never done anything that felt like it was because of a need before. Um, a lot of my scholarship feels very much like it is sort of for my own pleasure. Um, as humanities scholarship often is, it is kind of about the beautiful and the loved. But to do something that felt like a political intervention was really cool, and I highly recommend it. Um, so what we thought was, and this I think is really important, was that this book would be an initial step. Um, two of us editors are cis women. It feels like something that I would love to see trans folk putting together a collection in another, well, maybe already. Um, I think that they're probably the sophistication and the complexity of what we were capable of doing was not, okay, see, I shouldn't say that, was, was I, think we, I think that you could do better. Right, this is what I really believe. I believe that this is a first step in a project that could, in fact, be better than what it is. That doesn't mean I don't think this book is good. I don't mean to sound like I do. Um, I think it means that I can't wait for it to be the old-fashioned book that people reference as, well, it started with this, or this was a step along the way, but now we're doing something so much bigger and better than that. That's very much the vision that we had for this. Actually, as we were working on our book, all these other exciting things were happening. Um, and so, in fact, we're not any kind of first. Um, we are part of a kind of synchronous, serendipitous, joyful um, eruption of work about um, trans and non-gender conforming people in the Middle Ages. So even as we were working on our book, Blake Gutt and Alicia Spencer Hall were working on their beautiful book about transgender hagiography which uh, is just, I, I reviewed it, I have seldom read a better collection of, of, uh, of articles. It is a, just a really lovely piece. There was also, a, at the same time as us, uh, Colby Gordon's, uh, wait, I gotta look this shit up. Uh, Colby Gordon, Simone Chess, and Will Fisher were doing a special issue of Early Modern Trans Studies on Early Modern Trans Studies in the Journal of Early Modern Cultural Studies, which did a lot of the same kind of work as what we were doing at the, uh, with a more Renaissance rather than medieval emphasis. Um, Leah Devon, who had edited a special issue uh, called Trans, Histor uh, Trans Historicities of Transgender Studies Quarterly, also released The Shape of Sex, Non-Binary Gender from Genesis to the Renaissance, which I will be teaching in two weeks and which I'm really excited about. Um, and I can't help but mention that Carissa Harris, Sarah Bechtel, and Lisa, and Lisa Strakov um, have also recently published um, on a, I guess, less joyful topic than I'd like to think transness is, Rape Culture and Female Resistance in Late Medieval Literature which is also part, I, as I see it, of an emphasis or a movement towards asking questions about medieval sexualities and medieval survivors uh, who were not maybe the main voices that have survived to our day. So um, all of this work was happening at the same time. All of us were working through the pandemic. All of us were struggling as we worked through the pandemic but these beautiful things emerged. And so now we get to like crawl out of our caves and talk about them to you. So what is it that we found exactly? Um, so I think that one thing that's really interesting that our book talks about a great deal is we found that it isn't just that there was no term, say, for transgender or transsexual or trans asterisks in the Middle Ages and therefore those those kinds of people did not exist. Um, it's not that there was an alternative term necessarily, it's that the way that society organized its understanding of gender was profoundly enough different from how it is understood today that the categories that we think with would not have been applicable. The most important of those categories would be the normal. Normal is very much a 19th century invention it's, um, 
maybe it's an 18th century invention, anyway, it's later than my period. Um, it is something that had to be produced as part of a series of economic and social developments. There is no normal in the Middle Ages, um, which means that while there are concepts such as sodomy that indicate a sexuality that is uh, not right, um, the idea that sodomy is actually something that happens between, say, for instance, as we think of it today, two men, was not necessarily how it was understood. So in one of the pieces that we published, the Spanish Inquisition persecutes a person that I think we would understand as intersex, who lives their life um, initially as a female person and then as a male person, um, marries a man, then marries a woman, and this person at some point gets persecuted for sodomitical sex with their wife. Because if we assume that they are originally female, whatever that means, then sex between two women counts as sodomy. This is not your grandmother's sodomy, obviously, and it's not your grandmother's sodomy laws. So the Spanish, this is assuming your grandmother had sodomy laws, I know. Um, so the Middle Ages is kind of an expansive term. Nobody living in the Middle Ages thought of themselves as living in the Middle Ages, of course, just like nobody in the early modern period thought they were early for anything. Um, all of these uh, are very artificial distinctions that we have placed upon uh, historical periods, I would say largely for the usefulness of organizing things like departments and course offerings, sorry. So uh, the Middle Ages roughly spans, watch this, kind of the year maybe 200-ish to about 1450s-ish. And that's just in Europe and the other, other places have different ideas of the Middle Ages. So that's a, a lot of time to be responsible for, by the way. Um, so we medievalists um, would already tell you, I think any of us medievalists would already tell you, that the Middle Ages are highly queer in that normativ like normativity hadn't been invented yet. You weren't supposed to have same-sex sex, but you also weren't supposed to have sex during Lent. So you were kind of, <laughs> and Lent is quite long. Um, and so you're kind of, there, there's, a, there's a very definite um, sort of so much is being patrolled that nothing is being patrolled. There's so much, there are so many rules that nobody can keep their rules, um, I'm gonna say straight. Um, and so the, the fascinating thing about working in the Middle Ages is that you're always already dealing with a culture that is somewhat um, askew from what your expectations might be. One of the things we say is that we tend to see the Middle Ages through the lenses of the centuries that have come between us. Um, and so for instance, um, sorry, I was teaching this today, so I'm thinking about it. Female sexuality is something that um, we assume because of, I think basically because of Victorian ideas about sex, there's an assumption that women are very not interested in sex. In the Middle Ages, the assumption was quite different that women were excessively interested in sex, right? So when you look back historically, the person who is the sexual aggressor in a story might be quite different. Um, the kinds of, of scenarios that are being sort of imagined around the relationships of men and women, um, even heterosexual men and women, um, have a, a completely different shape in the Middle Ages than they do today. So this is, it's kind of part of the fun of what we do. Um, what I am really interested in is finding something that we, we, we use this as a touchstone a lot, uh, that Lillian Faderman called a usable past. I don't think there's such a thing as a past that is not being used though. So a usable past means a past that can help affirm and make possible the lives of the present. And I think that that's a really important vision of how history can work. Um, it doesn't mean doing violence to the past. It doesn't mean distorting things that are true into things that are untrue. It means looking to the past to see what it can actually do to find the voices that have been silenced before. And I will tell you truly, so much of what we found um, was really complex. There was very little people just speaking up and being like, this is who I am. Instead, what we get a lot of is, is uncertainty and um, ambiguity. So the part of the collection that I wrote, which of course I'm an expert on, so let me talk about it for a minute, is a 13th century uh, romance, which is like adventure story, called The Romance of Silence. And it has nothing to do with silence. 
except the main character is named Silence. I've always thought the main character gets named Silence as part of the dad saying, shut up. Um, don't talk about it. So Silence um, is, is born at a time when women cannot inherit property. And the parents, fearing that they will have no more children, and for some reason they don't, and it's not clear why, um, decide that they will raise this assigned female child as a boy. So here we have a problem with the word assigned sex, which is currently in vogue and which I really like. I tend to say that assigned sex is kind of like a homework assignment, like you've got to go home and do that. So this child is assigned female at birth. Someone looks at this child and reads their body in a certain way. And this has implications for, for instance, whom this child can marry and what kinds of expectations they can have of their life. But then their assignment gets radically changed. They get reassigned as a boy and raised as a boy. And because this is the Middle Ages and it is kind of fantastical, the allegorical figures of nature and nurture appear to this child and start debating kind of in front of her, them, start debating in front of them about whether or not um, they can be taught to be truly a man or if their nature is that of a woman that can and it, that is unalterable. And this debate goes on for some time and is repeated several times throughout the text. I will tell you that silence is the best warrior, the best knight, the most faithful friend that anyone sees in this romance. Um, they are also the most beautiful person and people swoon over silence just as much as they, um, I don't know, get knocked over by silence's sword or something. Um, they're sort of a, a, a superlative person and a, a, a kind of feminist response to silence has always been to say, well, look, Anything boys can do, girls can do just as well, right? In, in a non-trans affirming kind of way, people could say, look at this, this person, born female, whatever the hell that means, can go ahead and like, knock over all of your knights. Um, but that's a pretty limited way of reading the poem. I, I think that, that was the, it had its moment, and it's not, it's, this, this is a work of fiction, so it's not that there's a complete wrong or a complete right to be said, but what I would say is that the fantasy of this poem. And here's what I really think and what I think um, is so interesting. The fantasy is what if we set up the conditions to allow somebody to be trans? Right in the Middle Ages, in the 13th century. What would it take? Well, apparently, twist my arm, twist my arm. I have to be trans because, ooh, I really need to inherit my father's castle. Right? It's set up as a mm, forced masculinization, kind of like forced feminization scenario. But it isn't, right? Silence lives this life that seems full and rich. Um, and then Helders of Cornwall, the supposed author of this poem, at some point has to take it back. And like so many fairy tales, at the very end, the princess is no longer roaming free, but has to marry the prince and have a happily ever after. So I will tell you, just in case you get excited about the romance of silence, which does exist in modern English translation and also as a novel called The Story of Silence, um, I will, by Alex Myers, uh, plug. Um, the, it does have this ending that is problematic as hell, where silence is taken up, uh, is stripped naked before the court, revealed in their femaleness, such as it is, repolished is the interesting word, into a beautiful woman and sent off to marry the king. The king, who, by the way, is old enough to be her, like grand, their granddad, so that's an important detail there, too. Um, this is an incredibly problematic ending. But what we know about endings is that they often, as in Shakespeare's comedies, as in Shakespeare's tragedies, right, they often have to normalize or return to some kind of moment of stasis because too much freedom is such a dangerous thing. So there's this, mo there's this period, and it's quite a long romance, of adventure that then has to kind of get shut down. Um, we accept that because what we have to say is at least this text exists. It existed as a single copy, um, marked uh, things that are not very important in a box somewhere in somebody's attic until it got discovered, which is how we get a lot of things, right? The more normative gender and sexuality stuff, maybe um, especially the modern stuff, gets published and recopied, and there's a lot of it. This exists in a single copy with illustrations. Um, 
and is in itself kind of a beautiful remnant. Uh, we don't know how many copies there had been. We don't know if someone chose to destroy the other copies. We don't know what Heldress of Cornwall was, or if Heldress of Cornwall was telling um, a slant, a story about their own life. Um, what we do know is that these, in the world of imagination, in the world of fiction, it was possible to imagine a night like silence. Um, in real life, a lot of the people who lived their lives in a, in a, in a cross-gender manner, all of this assumes that there is such a thing as gender that you can cross, which there kind of isn't. Um, women who, people who were assigned female at birth who lived as men, people who were assigned male at birth who lived as women. In, we get information about them historically, often when they tangle with the law or when they tangle with doctors. Those are a lot of the sources that we have, and those sources kind of suck, right? What we get are sources that are about being, about stripping people bare, looking at their bodies as if their genitalia tell this whole story of who they are. What do we get are stories where people are being punished for who they are as part of finding out something about them, where knowledge is wielded as a violence. And that is as true of the medical professionals who are looking at case studies of trans people in order, or intersex people in order to like make conclusions about what their bodies did or could do, um, as it was for the persecutorial arm of the law, police on up, which went after such people because they in some fashion did not conform. I mean, I got to say, um, Anna Klasowska's contribution to the collection, um, whose name I'm going to totally mispronounce, Voynich, um, is a... Uh, going to have said it wrong, um, was a person who, I don't know if they were assigned female or assigned male at birth, they lived as both. They kept marrying people and stealing stuff from them. They were basically like a con artist that traveled Poland and got what they could out of everyone. They were apparently so charming that people kept marrying them <laughs> as a man or as a woman and giving them gifts. And this story is extraordinary, partly because what Anna sees in this, and Anna, my collaborator, is such a fundamentally joyful person, um, what she sees in this is that even if we just have this one person doing this, running around Poland, different regions of Poland doing this, um, it's possible that there were all these people who were queered by loving Wojnicz, right? That there were all these people who, you know, married someone who's genital sex is kind of unknowable by us, married someone who had been previously a woman but was now living as a man, married someone who had previously been a woman then was living as a man and was now living again as a woman. These were people who were queered by association to this fundamentally indeterminate, um, joyfully con artisty person who possibly, in the records that we got about them, was finally getting um, punished, which sucks, but at least we get to hear about them. This, by the way, brings me to some of the most complicated things that we found in our research. What we found is that because so much of the record comes from the police and the medical establishment, as it does, frankly, to this day, what we would get had a kind of violence to it, right? That, that in order to find a trans person, you'd need someone to strip the trans person. You'd need the trans person um, to have died like Billy Tipton, to have died and had to have some, had someone look at their body in a way that seems disrespectful and inappropriate, right? So um, one of my favorite pieces in the collection, Scott Larson's um, essay Laid Open, which is the only one that deals with America, talks about how, what the ethics are of speaking about a subject who seems to have lived lives as both a man and a woman, who seems to have crossed some kind of thing in their life, but without going into the kind of violating, icky looking at their body that a lot of these works are. We do not want to be voyeurs. We do not want to invade privacy. In trying to find queer people in the past and trying to find trans people in the past, we run the risk of not anachronism, not bringing categories from the modern world into the past. We do that maybe, and that's okay because those people existed and we need some framework to understand them with, the problem becomes when we violate their 
own selfhood, right, by staring, by making them into objects to be scrutinized. And that is a problem because we're scholars, it's our job to scrutinize things. And so the tension between the desire to know and the problems with that knowing was one of the things that I really encountered in working on this book. Another problem that I encountered as a queer person was the tension between gay, same-sex stuff and what I was doing in this book. And here's what I mean by that. Why am I gesturing with my book? Um, here's what I mean by this. Um, one of the really important early texts um, in trans medieval studies is a legal record that was published in GLQ, the Gay and Lesbian Quarterly, in 1995, year of our Lord, very long ago. The font is even ancient, right? This text that was published is a legal deposition by a woman named Eleanor Rickner, who had been assigned the name John at birth and had been caught selling sex in Cheapside um, to a man named John Britby. So John Britby and Eleanor were caught and brought into court initially as a prostitution problem, like sex work criminalization, but also then it turns out that Eleanor had, was, had been assigned the name John at birth and went, was in some way male, whatever the hell that means, without being voyeurishly scrutinizing. This is kind of a problem. So um, when they published the story of Eleanor and John, get accused of committing sodomy, what they said was this is evidence of same-sex love. Why is this evidence of same-sex love? Because if Eleanor is John and John Britby is John, then they're both Johns and they're having sex together and there we have, yes, evidence of same-sex love, great, the gays rejoice. But what this does is this, is this forgets the transness of Eleanor, which in time becomes an untenable move. So in order to get the gay, we had to, we, uh, had to sacrifice the trans. And honestly, the people who published this have already worked through this and essentially said this was not quite the right approach. We, I love this text, I love teaching it. One of the things it talks about is how Eleanor learned how to have sex as a woman, was taught how to have sex as a woman by other women. So how she was mentored by other women, how other women took her in and nurtured her. God knows what kind of life she had been living, that this was something that happened. But she ended up in a community of other sex workers who I think kind of seems, seemed to have set her up with a business of her own that could sustain her in life. Right? Survival sex work is not pretty, but it is a way of surviving. And... Um, in her contribution, Gabby Bukowski, M.W. Bukowski, in Trans Historical, talks about how in the description of John seeing Eleanor, he does a double take. I forget if this is actually in the, if this is something that Gabby remembers that wasn't in the text. But we think that, that maybe Eleanor was beautiful, right? Or Gabby imagines that Eleanor was beautiful in order to be able to do the work that she is doing. Um, I don't think beauty is a necessary component, and I also am not sure that I believe that there's such thing as beautiful and not beautiful people. But there's something to be said about um, affirming the beauty of this trans woman functioning in 1380-something um, in London, right, and surviving in the big city as who she was. So these are the kinds of stories that I love to tell, but I also notice that we end up trading these things around. Some stuff gets to be same sex, some stuff gets to be trans. The problem is that queer studies, LGBT studies, organizes itself at the outset on the assumption of the gender binary. And the many of you or your friends who are non-binary probably know how complicated that is, right? Because what does it make you if you are attracted to a non-binary person, if you love a non-binary person, if you partner with a non-binary person? Does it make you gay or straight? Does it make you non-binary oriented? Um, possibly the sexual orientation you bring to the table, it just stays your sexual orientation anyway. But the idea that we have organized a movement, and I love our movement, but that we have organized a movement around the assumption that there's such thing as men and there's such thing as, as women, is a very modern notion. And one that, while we know that we're persecuted for it, might not be sustained sustainable. We might want to not fight under that banner. We might want to be fighting for queer liberation, 
not on the basis of I male get to be with a male, but under some other kind of understanding of what it means to be queer. And this is really complicated for me. I'm working my way through what that would mean in the future. What I'm good at is talking about the past and the fact that that is how I think some, a fair amount of sexual orientation was organized in the past. So one last thing. In the Middle Ages, priests were instructed to pretend like no one had ever committed same-sex sexual acts before. Like we have a, a famous, um, Carolyn Dinshaw writes about the instructions for parish priests. Someone comes to you in confession and says, I'm having feelings, father, for a fellow boy. And you're supposed to say, oh my god, no one has ever felt those feelings before. There's no precedent for that. How did you invent such a sinful, terrible thing? Bad, bad, bad. Right? Making people believe that there was no other, there was no precedent for their desire is a historical mode of erasure. Right? And so, in fact, the ten, one of the tensions that this volume documents is when they did persecute sodomy, they would get in, they, they would, there was a kind of conflict about the fact that if you're persecuting the sodomy, um, you're acknowledging that sodomy exists, which already sticks your neck out for admitting that this has happened before, which is already corrupting some other youth. Right? The minute you say no, you're also saying yes, because we're so damn sneaky. So just to say, this is something that's part of the history. This is part of gay history, the, the denial of, gay, of the existence of gay people. But it has also been used about trans people, about denying that that was even possible. I was reading something on Twitter yesterday about people saying that you can't transition after 25, which is like bullshit and cruel. Um, and I was thinking like that kind of violent rhetoric, I know, I know, this is just so bad, I shouldn't even quote it. It is not true. But the kind, that kind of violent rhetoric is also about sort of telling people what they can't imagine. You can't possibly imagine transitioning, they say. You would not make a good whatever it is. But that's a lie, right? Eleanor Rickner, with no hormones and no surgeries and pretty much no anything, was passing as a woman in London and Cheapside. And I don't think that it's that she was just so genetically gifted. I think that we have these stories to hold on to that tell us that a lot of things are possible that maybe we had not known were possible. All right, I think that's what I got. I know I did some misgendering of my own, um, of silence while I was speaking. I'm not getting a lot of sleep because of the puppy, and I'm just really embarrassed about that part. Anyway. Thank you so much. I'm going to just help with question and answer by bringing, yeah, bringing you the mic if you raise your hand. Um, and wait till you have the mic to ask your question. Oh, I couldn't see your little hand. It was down so low. <laughs> there you go. Can I ask a th thank you so much for the talk. I can I ask a question about in studying medieval texts about the aspect of the text being fiction versus how much it's actually reflecting on the actual, I mean, society or community versus like fictional people imagining something that's more dramatic. Um, if you yeah, well, I'm trying to. So I think your question, I will try to say it back to you because I want to get this right, is the relationship between the fictional and the non-fictional realities for trans people in, say, the Middle Ages, but let's say in the same period. And I have to say, the, the romance of silence, which I'm talking about, is a way of imagining a life that is a trans or non-binary life. I'm, I'm not actually completely sure that it's a trans life, and my whole argument is like that it's too complicated to judge on. But um, making that decision in a fictional environment seems much safer because it's not talking about an actual a, a, a person that could get like punished for living the life that they're living. So here's what I will say. The accounts we have that are non-fictional are court records and um, medical records. And that's just inherently a much less happy picture than what I was talking about. Um, so the example of Eleanor Rickner, who does, you know, get arrested first 
for, have, for performing sex work and then gets in trouble for sodomitical somethings, right? Um, Eleanor Rickner would be the reality that is not fiction, and it's, you know, it's someone who's in court. We don't quite know what happens after that. We don't actually have a record of what um, punishment or lack thereof uh, she received, but it's unlikely that she received no punishment. So yeah, I mean, fiction is better, right? Uh, fiction is happier, and when we deal with fiction, even in the violent moment when silence gets all of their clothes taken off, which is like a moment that I just really like trigger warn the shit out of. Pardon my language, shit. Um, uh, 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 sorry. The, uh, uh, this um, moment when silence gets stripped naked, which is so very violent, is at least a fictional person getting stripped naked, right? At least it's not actually some person alive dealing with this. So even as my empathetic imagination reaches out to this, to silence in that moment of sort of being told what their truth is because their truth is apparently their naked body, who says? Um, nevertheless, it's not like stripping an actual like person down. And I think that that makes it more endurable just by a titch. Does that answer your question kind of? Hi, so I guess I'm kind of working through my question as I word it, but... Best kind. Yeah, I know, right? Um, when we see that trans people enter the record mostly as a means of being kind of accosted by or confronted with institutional sort of attempts to enforce a form of normalcy, do we get this impression that the law in this regard or medical knowledge in this regard are somehow res representative of or are stricter than um, sort of the experience that these people would have had in their daily lives because we've the book cites like multiple instances of trans people who get people to marry them Absolutely. Um, as either gender and so do we assume and these people like testify on their behalf right? right these people are like well like Eleno is the best husband a woman has ever had. He's so great, right? You right. Know? So, like, in like almost like a Boswell sort of sense. Not that I am fully I feel a little convinced Boswell by. Actually. Uh, I, I, he feels a bit too optimistic for me. But like, sort of in a Boswell sense, do we sort of assume that people cared less about it than we would assume? Or yeah, I think that people tangle with the courts when there's an inheritance issue. People tangle with the courts when someone tells on them, right? Or when they steal a lot of shit. Let's just notice that theft does get you in some kind of trouble. Sex work gets you in trouble. It's like those are moments when there's an interface with the law, say, and then with medical practices as well. But that's not, these are folks who live long lives before and after, well, we hope after, definitely before they get um, scrutinized by the law and medical establishment, and they are loved, they have children whom they raise, they are, they are part of communities. Sometimes they're not the communities that they were born into, but they're nevertheless communities. And we don't have evidence that those communities were somehow more radical and more sort of progressive than anywhere else. They're just part of normal villages and normal towns and normal cities, just like everybody else. So that, I think, is in fact a very hopeful thing. You know what I didn't talk about is I didn't talk about saints and religious figures who get to be all kinds of gender complicated things because God lets them. So I called my, I called my article Without Magic or Miracle because what I love about Silence is that they get to be like a non-gender conforming person without any actual stuff being done to their body except like that they exercise a lot and become a great knight. Um, and no, there's a lot of miracles where like, you know, you pray and God makes you a man, or you pray and God conceals the fact that you were assigned female at birth so that you can live in a monastery if monastery is where you want to live. But we have a lot of those saints. We have a lot of those um, records from the histories of Christianity. And that, I think I didn't talk about it as much because that's uh, Alicia Spencer Hall and Blake Goode's wonderful transgender hagiography book, which is all about that. And I'm like, that's their job. That's what they do. And their book is just beautiful. I recommend it so highly. Thanks. We have a question from online. And uh, actually, we have two questions. So I'll start with the first one. This is from Tekla. Thank you so much, Professor Raskolnikov, for this brilliant and engaging talk. 
I'm wondering if there are any examples of courtly love taking place in a transgender context. Courtly love seems like such a binary system of gender roles, but maybe it had some trans potential, and I'd love to hear about it. So I love the question, but I gotta say, I can think of, there's a lovely modern romance novel called A Lady for a Duke, which is, a, which is um, what is it, 18th century, maybe 19th century nobility trans woman getting, is being beloved by a cis man, and um, they go through a courtship system, pr procedure very much like courtly love. That's the only thing I can think of. Also today we were reading a pastoral uh, that featured uh, a young squire refusing to have sex when given the opportunity, and the young woman uh, in question making fun of his manhood. And we had like a spontaneous eruption of transness in class, and we're like, what if that's a trans narrative? But we don't know, and the pastoral does not say, and it's so short that you can't hang a whole lot on it. So I gotta say, mm, I wish, but I don't know of one, um, and I'm so sorry. Here's another question, and this is from Kate. Is there a translation of the Romance of Silence that you can recommend? Yes. So Sarah Roche Mahdi uh, published, I think in the 80s, um, Silence, colon, a 13th century romance or something like that. Very easy to find, used copies everywhere. And then Alex Myers, who's an interesting writer, wrote basically almost very close to a translation, but not, a novelization of the story of silence called The Story of Silence. And that came out in 2021, maybe, or 2020, maybe 2020. It's now available in paperback, and it's not even that expensive. So I recommend both of those things. Alex Myers could not stand the ending, I think. And so Alex finds a way to make uh, silence free at the end, which I love, but it's not quite accurate to the text. Um, but why not? If you're going to write, if you're going to write a novel, why not give it the ending you wanted? So All right. There's a bunch the of questions second. The there. second part of that question was: um, Are there? Uh, I see that there's some modern stories that are based on the romance of silence. Are you familiar with any of these, or would you recommend exploring any of them? And I think you. I just answered, answered that, that sort part of. too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marsha. This was wonderful, and I really look forward to reading the book. Um, Highly recommend. Excellent uh, book. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. At the beginning, you said that there's nothing normal about the Middle Ages, and then still in the stories you alluded to, there are certain rules. People suffer because they are being punished for something that you know was set up as something, it seems to me, like a rule, whether this is then normal or not. So I wonder whether... In the stories you are describing, there is maybe something that there, there is something like a like a political message, resistance or something. I mean, it, it maybe goes a little bit back to the first question. You know, is there is there something like a kind of activism behind this, or would this be totally off? That is such an interesting question because, of course, I want to believe that there is resistance, and we do say, right, like good Foucauldians, wherever there is power, there is resistance. And gender sure wields a whole lot of power. Now, I did not say, and I, I, unless I misspoke, and I probably misspoke a million times, um, I did not say that there are no rules in the Middle Ages. There is no normal in the Middle Ages. And binary sex, the, you know that phrase that like men and women are opposite sexes? That's not, that's not a given, right? The oppositeness of men and women is a kind of Victorian, I think, invention. Like, what is opposite anyway? Like, any and outy? Shit, that's not quite how it looks. Um, so it's confusing, right? Like, the, we have inherited a gender system that seems so natural and such a given. Yes, they had, were patriarchal. Women could not always inherit. Uh, women were treated badly. There was something called women that were organized to be subservient. There's a question that that was the case. It's not like they had no, it's not, it's not that it was gender anarchy, right? To say that there is no normal is not to say that there was gender anarchy. It is to say that the kind of normal that gets imposed now, that gets imposed, say, on babies born intersex, 
um, forcing them to be one or the other because you cannot be, ever be both. That was not yet a medical option, but it was also not yet a social option. There was a different system for controlling genders, and that system was maybe less concerned with genitalia all the time, and maybe not at all concerned with chromosomes because who knows what they are yet, and functions in, uh, as a different kind of thing. What we're talking about is very narrow European development, and one thing I haven't talked about is the ways in which this is also like linked up to white supremacy and to the idea that gets imposed on all the countries that get colonized by the West, that gender, that the way that the West does gender is the only way and that it has to be two and only two and all that stuff. Like that two or only two gets inflicted on like the Philippines and it kind of gets inflicted on the Middle Ages too and neither of those um, time and place necessarily, um, not that I'm equating the two, uh, but neither of them necessarily had that kind of organization to begin with, right? So the co colonizing hand reaches hard. There's a bunch of questions, I'm so excited. Hi, hey, so thanks for sharing about your work. Um, this question maybe follows on the, the pastoral example you just gave of sort of rereading this pastoral. I'm curious how, um, in, in this book you seem to be doing a lot of this reclamation of, um, especially of silence, it's this kind of unique, unique copy, unique text. Um, so I'm curious how you might reread or apply what you sort of learned from from working on the roman de silence with um, more canonical texts. So if this working is a on canonical text, so mm -hmm. if this isn't like a too normian example, like Chaucer, um, mm -hmm. or or reading someone along those lines. So. I'm working on Chaucer right now, and I'm doing exactly what you're saying, and it's very complicated. So let me give you my example. And uh, this is admitting to like the thing that I'm fighting, like I'm in the trenches with this right now. So there's a character in Chaucer uh, called Sir Topas who's ridiculous. He gallops, he gets described the way girls get described. He gallops around on his horse in a way that seems kind of gay. Um, he's described gaily, which is complicated because gay doesn't mean gay yet, but it kind of means gay, if you know what I mean. Um, and in the like 50s, medievalists pretty easily said, oh, he's light in his shoes, or some other um, euphemism for gay, 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 gay. And then people got like a little bit like more like, what is this thing called gay? And did they really think about it in the Middle Ages and kind of more rigorous about it? And so people stopped writing about Topas as gay. And in fact, I can't find anyone to quote who says that Sir Topas is gay, except these kind of, I mean, maybe they were gay men, but these like very mm, judgy people writing in like the 1950s. And what I don't want to say is that because a person evinces feminine characteristics, that makes them gay. <laughs> like, I don't want to be that kind of gender policing. And so I'm thinking a lot about what it means to say, we don't know this person's object choice at all. Like, they, they, they say they're in love with a fairy queen, but the fairy queen never materializes. So they're in love with a fairy queen, like, whatever, in a fairy kind of way. It's so gay. But it's not, right? And so the thing you have to do is not assume that gender transgression equals gayness but also not assume that gender transgression necessarily means transness, but it means something. And I'm wrestling with how to write about this text, which, you know, we've done the work. Chaucer, nothing's been left unwritten about Chaucer. But like what it means that this text sort of upsets gender rather than conforms to, to gender norms. And so, yeah, I'm fighting that fight with Chaucer every day or every day that I get to work on my book, which is not every day. I hope that answers your question. Yes, there's a question from Maggie online. Hi, Masha. I was wondering if you can add anything to our understanding of how trans folks figure into the transmission and discovery of medical knowledge in the period and how this process is reflected in your archive. It seems as though a lot of our current insistence on pathologizing gender and transness is still kind of medieval in a sense. Um. Gosh, I think that's kind of a misuse of the word medieval, where we sometimes use medieval to say bad or old fashioned or, you know, archaic. Um, sometimes we use it to say violent. I don't like those uses of medieval. Sorry, Maggie, I'm sure you're fine. 
Um, in fact, you're probably a medievalist and you were just, you know, talking. Uh, but um, yes, our ideas about medicine, oh God, you know what? I can't fully answer this question. It's too long an answer. I'm going to say that we now seem to be coming back around to ideas about humors and um, ideas about how human beings um, develop in the embryo as, uh, okay, all right, all right, all right, sorry, backing up. Um, embryology says that all of us were at some point not sexed and that the bits of us that become whatever our genitalia are start out the same bits and then they just do different things as they grow. This is a lot like medieval medicine. So in that sense, we've returned to the medieval. Um, it's a lot like medieval medicine where, however, it is believed that men, people who become men, are hot, and therefore their um, male genitals push out, while women are cold, and therefore their genitals stay in. This is ridiculous sounding, and yet embryology kind of confirms it. <laughs> so what do you do with that? So yes, in that sense, urban medicine is kind of medieval. The idea... Um, the, the, the idea that um, our medicine has continuity with that history, I mean, I don't think that any medical research knows about Galen. Any me medical researchers know about Galen, so it almost seems coincidental rather than continuous. Um, I think that the history of medicine really starts in the Renaissance, not in the Middle Ages, and very little of what brilliant doctors in the Middle Ages figured out really counts for much in like modern medical establishments. So I'm going to say I don't think that that's a continuity situation. I don't know if that quite answers the question, but maybe. One more question at least. Only one. OK. okay. This is so fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is so fun. Thank you so much for your talk and for also for all the questions you ask. And I really like the way you describe all the issues uh, talking about trans people in the archive and queer people and gender nonconformists because um, when uh, you describe the, the archival work, it seems like the people you, not you in particular, but historians what? are looking for are people who are successfully passing. Yes. Meaning that many of them, or of us, successfully passing, we won't ever find out. Yes. Meaning that in a way we are also gender conforming. And again, we trans people might sometimes be gender conforming and sometimes we might be gender non-conforming and queer. And so is there a way to articulate this distinction between trans as gendered, happily gendered, gender conforming, affirming, yeah. and trans as queer, which in this way would touch upon uh, queerness as gayness or lesbianism yeah. because this creates over more uh, original, let's say, <laughs> I can't say non-normative, but of a definitions of, um, of a types of transness. And I think that that's, there's a node of conflict between yes. the, in the definition of transness. There's, I mean, what a beautiful question, and thank you so much. And I, I think mostly I can say this back to you in, in, in different language and say yes. Right? Like, we don't know how many people were just passing. We don't know, and maybe we shouldn't know because they chose to live their lives as passing people, and therefore, like, let's leave them alone. We should not go after their naked bodies, right? So, yes, absolutely, there's a type of being gender nonconforming that is very gender conforming, right? This is not unlike the debates within, and this is something that, you know, is debated insofar as I can say this in trans communities. Um, queers debate this in queer communities, right? Some of us blend into suburbia and are no different, like homonormative gays, right? I sometimes feel like I am at this point, like I'm a mom. Like I blend in to heterosexuality in a certain kind of way that I don't intend, right? Like we become less queer sometimes as we get older, but also as we live our lives integrated into a society rather than actively persecuted, right? The moment we get, we stick our necks out as queers, as trans people, we are subject to different kinds of stuff. That's where the stories come from. The stories come from those who stick their necks out, who fight for their rights, who let themselves be visible. Those are the people who both take the punishment, right, who throw the, the bricks at Stonewall, and those are the people who um, become the stories that we do put into the historical record. And what that means is that the historical record is skewed towards the very queer and the very defiant. 
And I like that, but it's not the whole story, and we have to accept that that's not the whole story. I am really sure, um, in my um, article on silence, at some point I started talking about like why a person would want to pass as male, and I was like, shit, like I probably couldn't have passed as male, and I'm not trans, by the way. I kind of always hope people think I am. But um, I couldn't pass as male if I tried, but if I could, wouldn't it be lovely to run off and be able to have a job and not have to wear like uncomfortable skirts, like yay. And yet most people think that n most people did not do this. Most people did not take the job opportunities and more salary offered to men. They lived their lives as cis people, as cis women, despite what patriarchy does to women. So there's a balance here. Some people must have. Some people must have said, you know what, I can go on a ship and be like a sailor and I could run away from my situation and not have to marry that dude, right? And for, if I have to do that, if I have to pass as male to do that, that's fine. And some people said, I'm going to, I don't know, fight that fight and steal dresses from a guy named Philip whom then, and then claim that my husband's going to go after him, right? And like, those are the stories that we've gotten. We don't get that ship kid. That ship kid kind of escapes us. They just like go off and become a pirate. God bless. I just totally made up a story. I really. <laughs> well, I think that was all so wonderful to hear. And I know you want to take a few more questions, right? I mean, wanna, I or, could if you guys still have the energy. I know it's like five after five. Well, why don't we, okay, why don't we give a round of applause first? And then if you want to leave, you can and stay. Yeah. <laughs>